What's up, guys? It is the Blue Bloods here coming at y'all with another episode of our Pac-12 in 31 days theme going on. We're joined by Arizona football insider, video producer, podcast host for the Tutson Star. Alec White is joining us today, and I just want to say I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Yeah, of course, Zach. It's good to be here. Thanks for reaching out. And I'm happy to talk Arizona football because we, there's finally some positivity in the program and we'll get to that. But uh, this should be a, a good conversation about the direction of the program. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man. You know, before we even get to that, I kind of want to address the Pac-12 as a whole. It was a very tough year for, I think, every single team in this conference. Uh, Larry Scott made the decision August 11th to postpone the season Ended up, you know, changing his mind, having a very reduced schedule, no flexibility. It was criticized by a lot of people as other conferences went through their seasons. What was your initial reaction to the decision to postpone Pac-12 football? And did Arizona have any plans if Larry Scott doesn't end up changing his mind? Well, Arizona, if there was, wasn't going to be a football season, Arizona in the fall, Arizona wanted to do something in the spring. But thankfully, that didn't happen, and they were able to play five games in the fall, their first game against Utah got canceled. But when that decision was announced, like you said, on August 11th, it was it was really disappointing to to see that it was going to be a, either postpone all the way postponed till possibly spring, or there would be a really short season. And I'm just glad that there was football in general in the Pac-12. And even you know, with some of the Larry Scott decisions, I think once the season started, all of the Pac-12 teams did the best they could handling all the protocols, all the situations, um, you know, Arizona, the Arizona specific players on the football team, they were getting up at 6 a.m., 6.30 in the morning every day for several months during the football season to go through testing, then to go get breakfast, then to go get, you know, through weight room and film sessions and then go to practice. So it was a grind for these football players. And, you know, even though Arizona had, had a, a pretty rough season, I think, everyone here is, was just really thankful that a fall season was able to take place in the first place. Right. Uh, that's kind of the sentiment I got. I mean, when we did big 10, there were like three or four schools that were like, yeah, we were going to play. We were going to find a way to play a football game at least in the fall, but let's move to the on field stuff. I know I feel like you're kind of dreading this question. The 2020 season was really, really rough. you mentioned the struggles they had. zero and five. And I usually ask whether, you know, for the person coming on, the, the performance met their preseason expectations, exceeded or fell short of. I know the answer to that. 0-5 is not what anyone wants. But for you watching this team, what went wrong in 2020 for Arizona? I mean, I it, I think it starts with the defense. It was really, really porous. One of the, the worst in the Pac-12 against the run and then the worst in the Pac-12 against the pass, or maybe it was 11th. But you had a bunch of defensive players uh, opt out before the season and then during the season, Bobby Wolf, who was supposed to be one of the standout up and coming corners on this football team, he opted out before the season. Uh, you had a wide receiver uh, you know, opt out and then you had a bunch of quarterback issues. Grant Gannell, that first game against USC, Arizona almost beat USC in that season opener. Uh, in Tucson and a lot of people thought okay you almost beat USC there's maybe some hope for the season and then after that Grant Cannell was just really uneven then he hurts his shoulder on the first play against UCLA comes out and then is replaced by Will Plummer and you kind of get this back and forth Grant's out for a while then he comes back against ASU so defense and then quarterback instability on the field and then just a whole bunch of stuff with with Kevin Sumlin. Uh, you know, a lot of guys didn't seem to really buy into what he was preaching in the program. You still had this mix of players that were part of the Rich Rod era and then some of the new players that Kevin Sumlin brought in. So there just seemed to be this weird mash of old players and new players and philosophies not aligning up. And when you throw all of that together, you get the product that was the 0 5 Arizona Wildcats. And that's why Sumlin's out of a job. Yeah, and that's actually where I was going to get to next. You mentioned some positivity surrounding the program. Kevin Sumlin on his way out. Jed Fish enters as the next head coach for the Arizona Wildcats. Long career in the NFL. He only has like two, one or two games as a head coach in college. Um, he was a replacement coach for UCLA. 
but he was most recently the QB coach for the New England Patriots. We've seen so many people from that staff have success at all varying levels of football. Why was Fish the guy for Arizona, and what are your expectations for him? I think Fish was the guy because he – he didn't fit the mold of the previous head coaches that Arizona's had. You you look at Rich Rod, he was a guy that, you know, ran up tempo, fast, spread offense. And you look at Kevin Sumlin, who was supposed to be this bravado recruiter, a big Texas guy. And Jed Fish, he's a guy that has, like you said, had a lot of stops, and through those stops has built up a connection of uh, pipelines and connections with coaches and alumni and is a guy that is really f- his football smarts are, are off the charts we got a chance during the springtime to go out and watch practices and Arizona football social media did a great job kind of giving some behind the scenes access of what fish is like and you could just tell he lives and breathes football and I think that's really what appealed to U of A president Robert Robbins and athletic director Dave Hickey is they wanted somebody that was 100% bought into Arizona, wasn't going to use Arizona as a pit stop or a jump to the next level. Jed Fish has, has said when he first joined Arizona that his life dream was to be a head coach of a college football program. And his shot came at Arizona and you know he's been on record saying he's going to be here you know, for the long haul. And I think that's really what has been so eye-opening and refreshing as someone who covers the team is that he seems completely bought in to helping rebuild the program. Right. And I mean, I think you're going to have to be in for the long haul. The Pac-12, I feel like as a whole, is on the upward swing. So you're going to have to continue that here at Arizona. But the first big decision for Fish is going to be the QB1 spot. We're going to have to figure out who's going to lead this team into 2021. Gunnar Cruz, Will Plummer have been battling it out this spring. For you, what do each of these quarterbacks bring to the offense, and who is your favorite to be QB1 for 2021? So my favorite is a guy that you didn't even mention, and that's Jordan McLeod because he's a transfer. He gets here in June. He was not a part of the spring football season with the Wildcats. It was finishing up his term over at uh, – or USF, sorry, South Florida. And he's a guy, a dual threat guy who put up some pretty good numbers, had some good games over there in that area. But I think he's a guy that that really fits what Jed Fish is trying to do, which is have a mobile quarterback, not necessarily a guy that's a run first person, but someone that can get outside the pocket, make plays, very similar to a Jaden Daniels at ASU. So even though he hasn't set foot on campus, I think – his intangibles and his skill set once Jed Fish is able to to mold and customize him in that offense that he'll be a really good fit. Uh, but I wouldn't rule out Will Plummer or Gunnar Cruz, like you mentioned, as someone that could be a number one guy. Gunnar Cruz, Washington State, he's known for a, a pretty big arm, and he came in during spring season, and he was he was rocky. He started out slow but finished strong. And you could just tell at practice he was off timing with some of the receivers. And that's to be expected just because of of how new he is and finding out about the rhythm of the new offense. And Will Plummer, the one benefit he has over the two guys I just mentioned is experience in Arizona. He played a little bit this past year, had a lot of grit to come in against UCLA after Gunnell gets hurt on that, that first play and almost beats UCLA on the road. It shows the type of character and type of football player that Will Plummer is. So uh, Arizona is going to have a healthy quarterback competition this fall. Absolutely. I mean, and you know, spring practice is already wrapped wrapped up down there in Arizona. The spring game was back on the 24th, and I felt like they had one of the most unique publicized setups for that spring game. We had Teddy Bruschi, Rob Gronkowski leading the two teams out there. Team Gronk ends up winning the game 17 to 13. I know the quarterback storyline is a huge thing down there, but for you, what other storylines were you watching throughout spring? And what were your biggest takeaways from spring practices as a whole? Well, I think that the spring period was about generating positivity for the program and reconnecting some of the alumni base. And this isn't even, you know, on the field stuff that we're talking about. It was the spring was a lot of generating off the field uh, hype and not necessarily hype, but 
trying to move past the old brand of Arizona football and come into the new season with a refresh mentality. And we saw that with Gronk and Brewski coming back. It's the first time Gronk has been back in Tucson since he got drafted by the New England Patriots. And this was, you know, a decade ago. So to to have one of your most famous players of all time not come back to Tucson for 10 years says how bad it's been in terms of U of A getting the alumni involved. And so that's why I think the spring was such a big success because you had over 200 alumni, including Gronk and Brewski at that spring game. So just a lot of positivity off the field. And then the other storyline I think is, is figuring out how the defense is going to shake up. You have uh, Bobby Wolf's going to be back as the, you know one of the corners because he's opted back into the season. Uh, you've got a lot of transfers coming in at linebacker. Jason Harris is a guy I'm going to keep an eye on. Uh, if I'm you know scouting the Wildcats, he's going to slide in and play with his brother Jalen Harris, who's a pass rusher. So that brother combo on the field is going to be fun to watch. And I think really the spring period was was tightening up a lot of uh, you know the loose ends in terms of players coming back and then trying to move forward and and really uh, end the spring season on a positive note to get ready for the summer. Right. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's an exciting time. I think that there's a lot of fresh, fresh faces, new directions going down there, going down there in Arizona. And the 2021 recruiting cycle, you mentioned the transfers. This was a story of the transfer portal for Arizona, a top 80 class, but they signed a whopping 13 transfers from around the country. And their 2022 class is off to a, an amazing start. It's, I think it's top 30 in the country, according to 247 right, right, right now. But for this 2021 cycle, man, what were the biggest positional needs for this program? And who are some instant impact guys from this class that you expect to contribute day one down there in Arizona? Well, we the transfers we just talked about with the quarterback class, they needed they needed new pieces at quarterback, and that's Gunnar Cruz and uh and Jordan McLeod coming in. And then they needed to shore up uh you know the defense, the linebacker position, uh, like we've been talking about. Uh, Colin Schooler and Tony Fields were two staples in the middle of the field, and they're both gone. Uh, Tony Fields, you know, in the NFL and Colin Schooler over uh, at Texas. Um, so Arizona needed to shore up and get depth. This was about building depth, depth because last year they were playing that final game against ASU under the scholarship limit. Like they didn't have an, they were like a couple injuries away from having to play players out of position. And a couple of them probably already were. So this was about hitting the transfer market, getting stop gaps. Maybe not guys that are going to be here, you know, four or five years that as freshmen and leave as, you know, seniors. But you needed experienced players that could come in and contribute right away because Arizona is so thin defensively that they need pieces. And they picked up a couple transfers uh, at linebacker that I didn't even mention. Uh, yet they have uh, a Wisconsin transfer and then they have, uh, a Vanderbilt transfer coming in at the linebacker position, and there would be some edge guys. And then they shored up the secondary with a safety, Gunnar Maldonado, who's uh, a transfer from Northwestern. Uh, he had some experience there playing in the Big Ten. So pulling guys from different conferences and different experience levels, and I think you'll see a, a much improved defense. It might not be a top five top four defense but it'll certainly be a lot better than what we saw last year right and i kind of building off of that i want to get your opinion on this i'm assuming the recruiting strategies between someone and fish are going to be completely different in terms of where they build their base at and kind of the player they're looking for what do you think you'll see as we shift into this fish era what, what states do you think he's going to focus on most and what are going to be the biggest differences in terms of how and where he recruits well, anytime you ask Jed Fish a recruiting question, he's going to state Arizona is the one place that he's got to lock down. Before, before you think of California or Texas or any of these other pipelines that Arizona has connections with, it starts in Arizona. It starts in Tucson. starts in the Phoenix area. And Jed Fish's mantra is he does not want the best players in the state of Arizona to leave and go somewhere else for college. Uh, and we've already seen not necessarily him get – uh, the top players in the state, but he's gotten players that have left Arizona, the state of Arizona to come back. Gunnar Cruz is 
that guy, he grew up in, in the Phoenix area, went to Washington State. Now he's back here. Uh, they have the, the Northwestern running back. Uh, he w- left. He was a Scottsdale product. He came back as a transfer. Uh, so you're going to see really Jed Fish start to to hone down in Arizona. And hopefully there's there's more of that because Kevin Sumlin said he was going to try to lock down the state of Arizona. And then all of a sudden the big recruits, uh, Bijan Robinson goes to Texas, uh, Lathan Ransom at South Point. He goes to Ohio State. So it really starts about keeping the homegrown talent in Arizona. And then after that, it's probably going to be California just because you have a lot of, of coaches on uh, the Arizona staff that are familiar with that area. Uh, Brennan Carroll, the offensive coordinator and offensive line coach, knows that area really well. So does Jordan Pow Pow, the uh, tight ends coach. So I think you're going to see Arizona uh, do well in California. And then Don Brown, the defensive coach, he's going to be all over the map He just because of how many players he knows from coaching at um, – you know, Boston College and then Michigan, he's got pipelines all over the East Coast. So maybe Arizona gets gets a couple guys from that area. Right. I, I feel like we're seeing recruiting not only be kind of local areas, like, of course, everyone wants to recruit in state, but it's become so national with Clemson, Alabama reaching all across the country, grabbing players out of California, and everyone has to have that far reaching effect. So yeah. I'll be interested to see that. But Shifting to 2021 on the field, there's always those players that break out, especially under first-year head coaches. The scheme fits them better. The coach gives them an opportunity to get to see the field more. Who are some players on this Arizona roster right now that you expect to shine and have their breakout years next year? Uh, one guy I'm really interested to see is Stevie Rocker. He's a three, three-star, three four-star running back, depending on which site. Uh, recruiting site you check but he's from cd canyon del oro which is here in tucson and he was really good uh, as a running back he that's the same high school as kadeem carey one of the best all-time running backs in arizona history they come from the same school and he'll be a freshman next year and he looked really good in spring practice he wasn't supposed to get a whole lot of reps in spring but arizona had a couple injuries to two of its running backs and stevie rocker got an extra chance to get reps with the ones and the twos and he looked really good he's got some injury history he was injured missed his junior year of high school because of a of an ankle injury and then uh dealt with the same ankle injury a little bit his senior year that kept him out a couple games but when he's healthy he's really explosive he looks like he's added a lot of uh, weight in the weight room is explosive with the ball and arizona needs kind of a dual threat running back that can catch the ball out of the backfield, which Stevie can do. And then a guy that can run between the tackles uh, because they're trying to replace Gary Brightwell, who got drafted by the giants in the NFL draft. So uh, he's a guy that I think can really shine. And then the other guy I'm keeping an eye on is Jamari Joyner. Uh, He right now is dealing with a foot injury. He's going to be hopefully ready for fall camp, Uh, but he's a wide receiver he exploded two years ago in the 2019 season, became Arizona's top receiver, and then really fell off the map last year during the really bad year for the Wildcats. But if they get the quarterback issues uh, sorted out and Joyner's healthy, I think Joyner could be in for a really big season and potentially be one of the top five wideouts in the Pac-12. Yeah, I, yeah, Brightwell is going to be a monster. I, I really like that kid. I kind of saw him, like you said, he broke out in that 19 season but looking ahead to that schedule man the wildcats have a tough road to you know redemption they get road trips to oregon usc arizona state all three are probably three of the top programs in this conference going into this year along with tough non-conference games against byu and san diego state which you can never sleep on what is the ceiling and or floor for this 2021 team in your opinion I think ideally, I mean, right, Arizona fans will just be happy if they win some games, right? I think the first, you know, it's been 12 games in a row since the Wildcats have ended with triple zeros and they've been ahead of their opponent. It's been a while. So I think first and foremost, just to get a victory in this season will be nice. But, uh, you know, realistically, you're going to, Arizona for it to be successful, I think Arizona needs to have four to five wins to feel good about the the fish era and the direction that it's going uh the non-conference portion against byu 
in Vegas. That's the the season opener. I think that's going to be a really good uh, battle. Zach Wilson left for the draft. He's with the Jets now. He was the BYU quarterback. So they're going to be in, in a transition year. Maybe Arizona steals one against uh, the Cougars there and starts the season 1-0. and And then San Diego State, that should be a good one. Arizona could, could possibly win. Uh, and then NAU. So you're talking about, you know, two to three wins in the non-conference portion. And then, like you said, that Pac-12 schedule is brutal with those trips against Oregon, uh, you know, Washington in that mix. So ideally, Arizona is going to want to win hopefully two to three Pac-12 games. Maybe you steal a sixth uh, or a, a fourth Pac-12 game in there to get to six wins, uh, five wins or six wins. But I think ideally, if you're an Arizona fan, you want four or five wins. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's there for sure because you mentioned it. BYU, I don't think is going to be the same without Zach Wilson, at least not this year. I would imagine San Diego State is a toss up, and then you get week three, it probably a pretty good chance of a win. But yeah, the Pac 12, that's kind of where I want to move to next, is probably at one of the top points that we've seen in a long time. As someone who covers Pac 12, I'm always interested in your perspective, but we hear this narrative. The Big Ten, SEC, that's where the competition is. The Pac-12 is always left out of the college football playoff narrative. They never get a seat at that table, and it's because there's this perception that it's just different out West, even though you know, hosting this podcast, I don't think that's really the case. There's so many good teams out West. Why do you think the perception of the Pac-12 is down, and what does the Pac-12 have to do to change that? Well, to change it, I think they need to start – having their best teams make the college football playoff or at least be in that conversation because it's been a couple, it's been a while. I think Oregon was the last uh, PAC 12 school to make it or the only PAC 12 school to make it. Um, Washington, 2016. Washington, you're right. Yeah. Thank you for the, the correction. But uh, it's been a few years since we've seen a PAC 12 school emerge as one of the best in the country. And to do that, the Pac-12, what they do is they they eat their own. Nobody eats their own like the, the Pac-12 where you'll have Oregon all of a sudden get out to a really good season and then all of a sudden they get nipped in the you know in the butt by Washington and maybe that year Washington's having a down year. It just seems that whenever the Pac-12's best teams seem to be making that leap, uh, you know they suffer an upset loss and then the the rest of the conference just isn't strong enough for them to boost their resume. So it's easy for, you know, an SEC or a Big Ten school to suffer, you know, one or two losses and then beat some of the higher level opponents the rest of the way. The Pac-12 is so the gap between the top team and the the bottom team is so wide that there's not a lot of wiggle room for an Oregon or USC to, to lose one game or to lose two games and then still be in that conversation just because the other teams are, are so far below the competition level that they need. Right. And yeah, you mentioned, you know, getting nipped Oregon that lost to Arizona State probably cost the Pac-12 their best shot at a college football playoff appearance in a long time. Um, and then, you know, Oregon goes on and beats Utah in like a week and a half later and then knocks right. them out of the playoff race. So I just think the parity of the Pac-12 gets overlooked. I think there's so many teams that, like you said, could beat another team any given week. But Last question here, man. I am from you know Southern Alabama. I'm at K State now, so I haven't been. I haven't even been to the state of Arizona, but I want to get out there, see it, see Arizona. But what makes Tucson Arizona Stadium such a unique campus and environment on game days? Well, I think it has to do with the fact that in Tucson, the Arizona Wildcats are the only sports team in town. You have you know some of the other you know semi pro leagues, but it's a Big college, Division One, you know, and you're in a Power Five conference. It's not like an LA where you have the Lakers and the Clippers and the Dodgers and oh, oh, by the way, USC and UCLA. In Tucson, it is the Arizona Wildcats that people live and die by, and I think that's why it makes for just a such a unique atmosphere in in place to be, just because everyone is focused on the Wildcats. What are the Wildcats doing in football? You know, basketball especially. Uh, there's just so much fandom here for the Wildcats that you don't see in a lot of other places just because you know, you've only got one team to root for. And there's the Tucson community is built of a lot of people that come here for college and are U of A fans and then us alumni and then people that 
you know, people that decide that this they want to make Tucson their the retirement home. So you just have this tight knit community where people aren't always looking to escape Tucson. It's not like Phoenix where you're, you know, it's a you know gateway to, to other places. Tucson is is home for a lot of people. And I think that's what makes it pretty special. Absolutely, man. And yeah, when that, when Arizona is good, you can tell the fans are so invested and that stadium gets to rock in. But man, it's going to be an interesting year for Arizona. I appreciate you coming on here, you know, educating all of us about Arizona football. I love that we started this thing to kind of get all these teams some attention and, you know, fans that, you know, we're based out of the SEC country. I'm an Auburn grad. My co-host is from LSU. So we got a lot of SEC guys out here that don't stay up late for them Pac-12 games. So I'm so glad to get to hear. Yeah, I'm so glad they get to hear about it. But where can our listeners find you, man? I know you got awesome work over there at the Tucson Star and in Twitter and all that. So where can they find you? Yeah, so I work at the Arizona Daily Star in Tucson. And you can follow us at Tucson Star on Twitter and then I also, we also have a dedicated sports page, a sports Twitter account just for U of A sports. And that's uh, the Wildcaster, uh, at the Wildcaster on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, that you can get all of the Arizona Wildcats sports news. And we have the Wildcaster app in the app store too. It's free. You download it and you can get all of your Arizona Wildcats news for free. Don't even need a newspaper subscription. So it's, it's really great. And then my personal Twitter is at Alec White underscore ua and uh, i do a lot of live tweeting a bunch of u of a stuff and a lot of local high school sports as well so if you're looking to get plugged in on that route uh, i'll be doing a lot of that stuff as well absolutely guys make sure to go do that the high school sports scene in arizona is so underrated there are studs that come out of that state every year so make sure to go follow alec everything that he's doing and make sure to tune in to some Arizona football this year. I promise y'all it pack 12 after dark guys is worth staying Nothing up. For, like I it. promise. <laughs> I don't know that, that UCLA Washington state game was like the price of price of staying up late forever. Oh, that, yep. that game was bananas. I can't believe it. And hopefully y'all don't get stuck. I believe well, it was, I think it was UCLA and Washington that had to play at like 9 a.m. Yeah. Or, those, those 9 a.m. Kickoffs. I was, it's, I don't know. The, I would be interested to see how those would do over a, the course of a few seasons. But you know what? Pac-12 football, put it on any time. There's going to be something wacky that happens no matter what time it's on. I love it. I love it. I definitely still up and watch, guys. You need to, too. But y'all know where to find us, man. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching this and or any and all podcast streaming platforms. We'll be back with another episode of Patch Home in 31 Days. Washington is up next, so make sure to tune into that. But for Alec, for myself, and for the Blue Bloods guys, we are out. <laughs>